Well, thank you all for having me. My name is Caitlin McCulloch. I am the director of the Livestock Marketing Information Center. And today we're going to talk about U.S. cattle and beef uh, systems adjusting through the COVID-19 event. My organization is a nonprofit and we cooperatively work with 27 U.S. land grant universities, um, 13 associate, associate members, which are trade organizations largely, and then USDA. And a lot of the data that we source and that you'll see today is available through those USDA agencies. So a couple of things when we're talking about this pandemic and what to look for after the pandemic, um, one thing to keep in mind is that we're still very much in this and the uncertainty around what's gonna happen with the virus coming this fall for the US, um, whether there's a vaccine and the economic picture are still very much up in the air. So against that backdrop, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll provide the caveat that we that a lot of things are still uncertain, but there's a couple of things that I think we can take away from it at this point in time. And those three things I've outlined on this slide. So the U.S. is going to continue to focus on developing high quality beef that's really going to provide an enhanced eating experience for the consumers. And that's been a long term trend that we've been working on through genetic um, genetic gains. The other situation is supply chain factors. We saw significant disruptions here uh, with the COVID-19 event, specifically related to slaughter, slaughter plants closing. Um, and then lastly, where does beef demand go from here? And does it do consumers' tastes and preferences look as they did before the pandemic? So in the US, we have um, a breakdown of quality grades of, of five different distinctions for fed cattle. Um, prime and choice are the top two tiers, and this graph shows you just the uptick in that percent graded um, choice. So this is what percent of graded cattle uh, register under this choice category, and that's the second level. Um, prime is the highest in the U.S., and you can see that growth curve has continued to climb. Now this is a relatively short-term trend, and a lot of it has to do with an increase in the number of dress weights, an increase in dress weights that we've seen fed cattle um, increase to as they've had to remain on feed longer because of the slaughter situation. But longer term, we've really seen an uptick in the percent grading prime. That's that highest category in the US. So from 2015 and 16, we were sitting about 5% of carcasses were grading prime. Now in 2000, in the first half of 2020, we're closer to 10%. So that's an enormous change over a fairly relative short period of time. And that's really been focused on both um, increasing the number of days on feed, putting a lot more investment in genetics um, towards that heavy marbling and increasing um, that eating experience. The other thing that we've seen more specifically pandemic related is how, um, how, how cattle producers are being paid. Um, and so in any black swan event, it's a little up in the air how, how these market trends kind of sort themselves out. But these are the main groups in this graph um, of how the U.S. is going to sell cattle. So we have negotiated, which is largely a spot market price. So that's um, anything that's going through an auction situation or being outright bid um, when it's ready to be delivered. And then these other ones are more marketing arrangements um, that deal with other types of relationships. That dotted black line on the bottom uh, used to be close to 5% or so of transactions. And during the COVID event, um, that negotiated grid has really jumped up to over 20 percent and part of that is because you're seeing those prices increase because of our all the carcass quality characteristics that are adding to that bottom line for that for that animal and so a little bit unique here for the COVID event but part of that is the increase in prime and so folks that are able to price cattle on a negotiated grid are getting paid more and you've seen more interest um, for those producing higher quality cattle they're going to want to benefit from that and change their transaction type um, to something that really benefits them. On the supply chain side, uh, the U.S. had several plant closures, um, not specific necessarily to beef, um, but since this is a cattle pr presentation, we'll focus there. And a lot of it had to do with the health and safety of workers. So one thing to keep in mind in the U.S. is that it's a decentralized health system. Um, so initially those decisions to close or keep plants closed or open um, were very much at the county, county level or the state level. Um, the President Trump did put in an executive order to move that decision to, um, to a federal essential um, 
essential worker level. And so that mitigated some of the closures, but still all these, these um, supply chain processes needed to put in place personal protective equipment to ensure the health and safety of workers. And that's what the system we're operating on today. Um, it's not that we, we can't close plants, it's that we're doing a lot more testing. We've put in um, personal protective equipment, uh, dividers, in some cases we've spaced the lines, the line, um, the workers on the line in further distances and slowed change speeds to accommodate that. I think that is probably a longer term trend that we'll see in the US beef industry, um, especially until we have maybe a vaccine or something more concrete to be able to deal with COVID-19. And, and so some of those changes are really depend on where the virus goes from here. On the feedlot side, um, again, we backed up significant numbers of cattle into the feedlot in that they weren't able to move through the slaughter system at the normal speed that they were. Changes on those, I think, are going to be less substantial. It was really, it's really more of a short-term thing in terms of managing cattle rations, managing weights, deciding what cattle need to be marketed when there is space available. The bigger long-term trend that we probably don't know for sure what's going to happen is how the supply chain is going to handle um, animal to market delivery. So the U.S. is very much a what we would call a just-in-time system, where from harvest to uh, either shelf space or, or food or restaurant is a very quick window. It's not necessarily getting routed to cold storage. We consume a lot of fresh product up here. And slaughter plants too are making a lot of paste ready products. So when you have a disruption at the slaughter level, it really slows down the whole system. There isn't necessarily um, a lot in cold storage that is able to go through those supply chains if you do have a significant impact at that level. And I think some of this depends on timing. We seem to have really worked through the slaughter situation in the US. And so maybe there aren't necessarily the need to put in safeguards but for example, in the case ready system, um, grocery stores and other retail places no longer really have the back end space to, to fabricate a carcass or a primal on their own. And so some of that has just gone away with this transition in the industry. And if we see some of that come back, that would potentially be a risk mitigation strategy for a retailer. Um, but I. It, we don't necessarily know how much that's going to just change. When you have a just-in-time system, distribution, logistics, and cold storage all sort of fall into that time frame as well. We don't have a ton of cold storage where you could move to a system where you're storing a lot in a frozen in a frozen system and then moving it. You'd have to build all that infrastructure. So again, I think it depends on how long uh, the virus takes to get into, under control and what sort of safeguards we need to, to invest in that uh, infrastructure. One thing that I do think, though, is absolutely going to change is how we is further automation. So one of the keys here to shutting down these slaughter plants and closures um, was absenteeism uh, related to workers either being fearful to come to these plants because of the exposure load um, or, or actually physically being sick. And based on how tight the labor market generally was in the U.S. at that time, that's really created um, really created the perfect storm of just physically not getting enough labor into these jobs that are that are skilled and couldn't necessarily just auto fill uh, from whoever was available. Um, and so I do think you're going to see a more aggressive movement to automation in these sectors um, where, where you can. Just really quickly, here's a graph of the cattle slaughter. We expect about we expected about a 14% decline in second quarter slaughter, so a fairly big dip from a year ago. And you can see by the end of June, we've largely moved past these. So again, it matters how quickly we can we can continue to slaughter at what we consider normal levels. Um, but again, we have a lot of systems in place now to protect health and safety, and so reaching those levels takes takes a different strategy than it did before. And one of those strategies that's been employed is a Saturday, excuse me, a Saturday harvest day. Um, and you can see that by the level of sa Saturdays that we've um, slaughtered above a year ago. So continuing, we're expecting that to continue in order to meet um, the slaughter levels that were similar to a year ago in order to keep those cattle moving through the system.
So I mentioned cattle being backed up on feed. Almost all of the fed cattle in the U.S. are going to move through a feedlot um, on some type of grain finishing ration. Um, the number of cattle on feed, although it's below a year ago, we actually have a substantial higher number of cattle that have been on feed longer. So longer days on feed, meaning they've been in that feedlot a significantly longer portion of time. So right now, um, we have about 1.1 million head higher than last year that have been on feed for more than 120 days. Um, so a significant uptick in just that specific category. Now to work through um, work through those cattle numbers and to move those cattle from from a maintenance ration or hanging on excuse me hanging uh, hanging back in those feedlots, you're going to need those slaughter levels to continue at at least above a year ago, if if not higher, in order to move through that backlog and to have a more normal uh, feedlot system um, mechanism in place. So all of these things are really wrapped up though in how much the consumer can purchase beef, what the interest is from a, from a beef for demands perspective. So the first half in the US was largely a supply situation where we were struggling to maintain that throughput of having cattle be fed, be slaughtered and make it to the grocery store. In the second half of the US, we perceive that the slaughter plant situation is largely gonna be well controlled, even if the US has another um, significant wave of coronavirus, that remains to be seen. Um, so we're, we're optimistic that that would not result in a slaughter plant closure. But the second half of the US is we're really focused on how well the consumer is going to be able to afford beef, um, and not just in the US, but um, worldwide. So. The U.S. Is, has entered a period of recession, as has the world. World economies are going to struggle to move forward. And in a general sense, beef is more expensive than these competing meats. The U.S. is still largely a U.S.-facing market. Um, and so the domestic consumer sentiment is important. We're looking at fairly low levels, um, not quite as low as the Great Recession for the U.S. in 2008, but still substantially lower than where we were um, in 2019, and we'll really need to see the economy pick up in order to, um, in order to see a lot of movement from a beef demand side. So there's there's the economic implication of consumers not maybe wanting to spend as much on food, but there's also still the restaurant implication. So in the U.S., we say it's about a 50-50 mix uh, pre-coronavirus between uh, what you would consume at home and what you would have consumed outside the home. Obviously, during coronavirus, with restaurants completely shut down for several months, um, we've moved completely to being in the home, and now we're only gradually starting to see those areas open back up. Now, I think um, the the interest in the domestic in the U.S. consumer to partake in those specific areas is going to be relatively slow, um, and folks aren't necessarily going to rush out to participate in restaurants. And so that's going to be a significant headwind for, for U.S. beef moving on the domestic market. Now on the world market, again, it comes down to affordability. What are their protein alternatives? Exchange rates come into play, um, all of these things. And so far this year, um, U.S. beef and veal exports had a fairly strong first quarter. Um, but ever since um, the U.S. really had really shut down and had this um, widespread uh, pan, uh, widespread number of cases, U.S. beef and veal exports have, have dropped off. Now, some of that is um, beef, U.S. beef became much more expensive when we had slaughter troubles, um, but the U.S. dollar also, um, also improved relative to other currencies um, during the May timeframe as well. Um, U.S. beef has become less expensive and so maybe more attractive as, as we move forward. And this chart just simply says, you know, the U.S. is a net importer of beef um, as it is, so we still are importing quite a bit more beef. And when beef became more expensive, you can see this level really jumped up. I don't think that's necessarily going to change with um, with coronavirus or post-pandemic. Um, the U.S. consumes a substantial amount of beef, and and we'll still need to import um, post-pandemic as well. So the big question is maybe how well positioned we are moving forward after the pandemic. And, and to me, it comes down to how 
big of an impact it has on the economics of those that are producing the capital. So from the cow-calf operations to the feedlots to the packers. Now, packer margins have been very strong post-pandemic, or excuse me, during the pandemic, post-pandemic, probably not gonna see a lot of changes there. Um, on the other side of that though, um, the US has also already been in a contractionary phase, meaning we have about every 10 years, we see cow numbers um, have, a, have a peak or a trough. Um, and so we were already starting to see less cow numbers um, last year. And I think the pandemic will just accelerate that in terms of this cattle cycle. So those two dotted lines you see are kind of our best guess at where where the numbers are gonna fall uh, moving forward, um, subject to change. But this definitely put more pressure on the cow-calf um, people to look at their look at their financial situation and and understand how much uncertainty they can they can deal with. We see it, we did see an uptick in beef cow slaughter numbers. So this is that cow calf herd. It's it's been above a year ago for the last several weeks, but I think a lot of that is residual from the de then from the slaughter disruptions we saw in the beginning part of the year. And ultimately, we're still we'll, we are still estimating um, the cow calf side of things to have a positive year year over year. And I think that largely depends on how optimistic the beef in, or the, excuse me the cattle industry is coming this fall. That's when our uh, cow, the majority of our calves are going to be sold and that's ultimately going to determine what that bottom line is and how much liquidation we see in the future. So a couple things to just wrap up. Again, we're in the midst of this pandemic, so it's still really early to call for widespread change from a structural standpoint. Um, and this isn't just affecting cattle and beef markets, but it's also rippling across the food sector. So from a labor perspective, we're struggling to get uh, fruits and vegetables harvested. Um, other systems that have heavy um, labor participation in uh, food service have are also dealing with labor impacts, maybe just not on as wide of a scale as maybe the slaughter facilities have. We have seen a change in purchasing patterns. When you move completely to a retail side, you know, all of a sudden we had an entire country asking, how do I, what do I cook and what do I cook every single night? We, we are cooking all of our meals at home for a significant portion of this. And that has changed what we're eating compared to what we're gonna ask someone else to prepare for us. Now, some of us have become better chefs and experimented quite a bit. Others have stuck to more uh, tried and true comfort type foods. Um, and I think those patterns aren't necessarily gonna have long standing issues unless you continue to feel like you would not want to participate in the restaurant sector. And if you're going to continue to cook at home. In general, I think we are going to cook up more at home than we did before. So maybe you see that 50-50 at home versus outside the home um, ratio change a bit. Um, but ultimately, it's going to depend on how fast we start moving back into that restaurant sector. One note I would say is that COVID-19 um, has emerged to be in everyone's minds, but before that we were dealing with African swine fever in Asia. And I think that's gonna reemerge as a big factor moving forward. And ultimately um, before COVID-19, all, all production export oriented countries were focusing on that, on how do, we, how do we grow our protein source to export to these countries that are gonna have a shortage. And I think that will continue to be a factor. And it's right now, it's it's right now in the shadow of COVID-19, but I think that'll be probably a longer term protein, protein supply chain shaper uh, than maybe COVID-19 has been uh, this year. Again, a lot of questions um, about the virus and what happens next, but hopefully this has given you some things that we're thinking about. And thank you again for your time.